uh, break. Sorry about that, friends. Got a little caught up with work on the side, but we should be good to go for the rest of the evening now, and fingers crossed, I'm gonna try to give you guys roughly three to four additional hours of Travis Strikes again tonight, because, uh, I'm liking this playthrough, and from what I've seen in chat, you guys are as well. So I want to carry on. Now, last time, or before the break, I should say, we finally cleared the coffee and donuts stage, which, again, I'm fairly certain is the longest in the game, and defeated Brian Buster Jr., or the Kenny Rogers-looking guy, and should have received some new faxes and promo materials. Let's check those out. First from Clark. <clears throat> so you've cleared the third game. Simply knowing the following information puts your lives further in danger. So I didn't want to tell you, but now I guess I have no choice. The military and the CIA were involved in the development of the Death Drive Mark II. Juvenile and I first met in the DD Mark II lab. Barely ten years old at the time, we were both orphans and scouted by the development team after our hyper-intelligence was noticed. Um, since we haven't played it on stream and it's kind of a niche title, it not- Hey, Eclipse, welcome back. Glad to see you, man. Uh... You may not be familiar with this if you're not super familiar with Suda's work, but this game and its world draw heavily from the, like, mid-2000s cult hit Killer7, with some characters even appearing, uh, in this title that featured prominently in that one. The Death Drive Mark II was originally developed for a project to move people to Mars. In this project, the glove would collect personal data, then send that data to a machine on Mars. There, a device sort of like a 3D printer would create a clone of the person, thus populating the planet with human Martians. This is the actual plot of the game. Oh my god, the CIA kidnaps a bunch of 10-year-olds because they're geniuses and makes them create a virtual boy that can, like, populate Mars with a bunch of 3D printed clones. Oh my god. <clears throat> However, the CIA repurposed the technology for a different project, in which they plan to create murder machines here on Earth. If drones could be used to hull the printers to enemy territory and print out soldiers there, then they could pull off everything from assassinations to full-on terrorism to their heart's content. The printers were terrifyingly accurate and can print up everything from humans to weapons. What? what? Why is that phrased as though weapons should be more uh, impressive than 3D printing a fully functioning human being? <laughs> Uh, in order to stop this project from taking off, Dr. Juvenile planted bugs in the mother machine still in development, preventing it from working properly. Now you can probably imagine just what'll happen if you manage to clear all of these games. That's right. The mother machine lying dormant underneath CIA HQ will reset, and the CIA will re revive the Death Drive project. <laughs> Please, I beg of you, stop and turn back now. Hey, bunny, good to see you. You caught us as we, uh are uncovering more of the game's plot, and it's amazing. Eclipse asks, maybe humans are cheap in this world? Uh, given that I get more money from mowing the lawn than I do for killing a few security guards, then yes. Um, now Jean's in life is destroy. I'm currently resting after having moved around four different houses. This house seems abandoned. There's no trace of anyone here. This room looks like it's being ransacked, and there are what appear to be bloodstains on the floor. It's really uncomfortable here, please come for me quickly. I think she's in the cult facility. Bunny says I was playing something else for once. Oh, right on! What was it? Hey, Starlight! Welcome back to the stream. Good to see you. Um, we uh, completed No More Heroes 2 for the first time on stream as of last night, and now we're playing through uh, Travis Strikes again. A game which I have played before, but have not played any of the DLC for. Um, we're out to rescue Jean, and life is destroyed tonight. Oh, Bunny says Harvest Moon DS. That's a good one. The Harvest Moon games are really high quality. They inspired a lot of uh, modern, more complex iterations on that formula, like Stardew Valley, uh, that people seem really, really fond of. Starlight says, I've also been playing something else. Right on, what is it? What y'all playing tonight? Okay. I think we'll start at Toilet 4. Uh, Starless has a little indie game called Later Alligator. Alright, I've not heard of that one. It's a very cute title. What's it about? What's, what's the central conceit? Yep, this should be where Jean is.
Hello, Vegeta. Or maybe the next house? MC says, I've also been playing something else. Stomping memory leaks in my game engine. For the, uh, for the mod? Or for the, like, other project? Eclipse says it's a very cute game. Right on. Okay, so even though all the blood stains are on the wall here, Jean must be in the next house. Bunny says I've loved Harvest Moon since I was six. I've had the DS game since my sister got it for me for Christmas as a child. Oh, that's so sweet. I had the uh, GameCube title when I was a kid. And it was, a, it was a pretty fun time waster, a little more involved than, like, Animal Crossing if you want a relaxing, casual sim. If he says, ultimately, for both. So, now, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but are you using a pre-made engine that you've made modifications to, or is this, like, an engine you have built yourself? Because, like, if anybody could make a video game engine from scratch just for mods and the like, I would imagine it would be you. Oh, shoot, you did! Right on, man. That is amazing. I tell you what, you wouldn't be having any of the problems I have with trying to teach online this semester. I, I guarantee that. Okay, so we want to stay away from Doppelganger's Pursuers. There we go. Yep. Bunny says, at first I didn't think I like it, but then I got obsessed. God, I may be a sunshine person, but Harvest Moon will always have a special place in my heart. Well, there's absolutely nothing wrong f with belonging to multiple fandoms, or, like, having multiple passions, or hobbies, or pastimes. Um... And one doesn't have to be superior to or first and foremost to the others. Also, this is a pretty good life lesson in general. As much fun as entertainment may be, remember, you do not owe any multi-billion dollar earning multinational corporation your loyalty. Or your, um, semantic attachment. That has been Brady's Soapbox for the day. Hold on. Whoop. Starlight says it's a point-and-click adventure game that takes place in a city called Alligator, New York City, where you help another alligator solve a mystery. Oh, that sounds incredibly charming. There, there's been kind of a resurgence in the point-and-click genre of late, hadn't there? Oh, there she is. Perfect. Bunny says, yeah, that was a nice half hour. Back to sunshine now. Okie dokie. Yeah, yeah, MC says, I owe multi-billion dollar corporations my own personal distaste. <laughs> Amen. We all, we've all seen Cyberpunk, we've all been there. One of my favorite things to do is grabbing one of the little weaker enemies that a generator summons, or spawns, and throwing them straight back into it. Oh, that's so satisfying. For a game with very simple combat, the special moves all feel kind of weighty and substantial. Oh yeah, and MC! MC's got a great point. Bunny, a real game gonna play Sonic 3 and Knuckles? Oh. Sonic 3 is so good. I've, I've got to finish it one of these days. I had, like, a bunch of partial playthroughs when I was a kid. Like, very young. But I've never actually, like, completed the full game. Ditto for Sonic 2, in fact. I have beaten Sonic 1. But I, uh... I really need to complete the second and third, because Sonic 2 is amazing. I remember, um, really languidly playing through to Oil Ocean Zone uh, the day after I got my uh, wisdom teeth removed. I don't know how I made it that far in that game while I was <laughs> on another plane of existence. 
Um, Starlight says you'll mostly be talking to different friends and family members and doing different minigames to collect items that contribute to the ending of the game. Okay, so I assume it's one of those cases where the more conditions you meet and the more items you collect, the more complete or the happier your ending. Some of the minigames are basic and some are really, really fun and hilarious. Oh, right on. MC says I finished 2 and 3 with all the characters and endings. I... I need to play those, man, and I also need to play Sonic Mania, which I own on this console. I've just never played before. We're fighting Sheep Man for the experience, then we're going to go back to the uh, the trailer so we can uh, throw ourselves into probably, again, the best stage that I remember playing. There we go. We probably need to check out Brian's chip while we're in here as well. And I want to say every boss, including the final boss, will give us a special chip, but I, I don't know about the la that last one. That should do it, yeah. Okay, real quick, let's see. Oh, we've got more than enough experience to level up. We're not... Eh, we're about two-thirds of the way to uh, our tenth level. That's pretty good for this point in the game, if I recall. So the Strike Freedom Chip fires a guided laser from an orbiting satellite... Laser can be aimed using the stick after activation. Oh, that sounds good, but is it better than our wing chip? The, um, like, the, um, arc lightning beam. I don't know. I don't know, because that can jump to so many weaker enemies and just take them out, or temporarily incapacitate bigger enemies. Hmm, what do you guys think? Do we want to experiment with the new chip or keep what works? Because all four of these just work. Uh, Starlight says there's one that caught me completely off guard. I was laughing out loud. Oh, yeah? What was it about? I think I'm gonna keep our moveset as it is for now, because these four skills just work with me. Cliff says I'm always one to experiment. Okay, okay. We'll give it a try. Wing Chip's really good, so I've got, I've got high expectations. We didn't try Mr. Doppelgangers because it's just a decoy. Okay. Starlight, that's totally fair. They say, I don't want to say, you got to see it for yourself. Fair dues. Now, if you have not seen um, Travis Strikes Again before, which I'm assuming most people present in chat haven't, you, uh, you guys are never going to guess what the last game is. I know I didn't. But if that, if that last fax wasn't uh, enough indication, the story of this game gets very, very ridiculous as time goes on. Now it's time to speed our way through another text adventure. And then take on... Again, a stage I think you guys are really gonna like. MC, in particular, given your aesthetic preferences, I think you're going to adore this next stage. National Census, okay. Do you believe in urban legends? Me? I love them. I'll read any book with urban legends in the title. Now for the segue. I got word from Kamui. Count Dracula is not only both real and alive, he's a death ball collector too. So they go to Romania to find Dracula and steal one of his video games. Um, and a horse named Epona takes him to a bunch of old castles that are not Vlad Tepish Castle. This is absolutely insane. If only it wouldn't take me like, you know, 10-15 minutes to read through each of these at the very least.
Oh no, sorry, the video game was inside Dracula's brain, of course. Mondo Zappa, what the hell? Oh, this is a... This is the protagonist of a different grasshopper game called Killer is Dead. That's the one where you have to assassinate Thomas the Tank Engine in the second to last real stage. It's... it's amazing. It's absolutely friggin' amazing. It's got some really uncomfortable design, uh, for some of its characters, but the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay and boss designs are all amazing. Starlight says, um, there's also a time mechanic where you only have, uh, so much time to talk to as many people as possible and get the better ending. Overall, it's really wholesome and adorable, and it was so worth my time. Right on, thank you for sharing. I'll, uh... Oh, sorry, it was a fake Dracula with a video game in its, its, uh, fake skull. Right. Um... I will be sure to look into later, Alligator. This game is not quite as enjoyable as Killer is Dead, largely because the latter has greater variety in, like, stage and boss design, and also because you get to assassinate Thomas the Tank Engine. Which I cannot emphasize enough, as I have throughout this playthrough, I am not exaggerating or ap applying creative license to the interpretation of whatsoever. That is actually what happens. Well, we've got our next game, uh, Golden Dragon Grand Prix. I hope you guys like old school, like, Japanese sports fiction. Like, really old school. Oh, this is so cool. We're gonna go ahead and take a look at the promo sheet. Who will survive the race, and what will be left of them? Racing. With murder? A four-kilometer straightaway with shocking twists. You've never seen a racing game this thrilling before. Take control of your monster machine and dominate the GDGP. In the 22nd century, the Japanese auto industry dominated the formula racing scene. The world at large became annoyed and changed up the rules. Japan now has the deck stacked against them, with winning deemed impossible. However, oh god, that is uh, some language I am not interested in reading. Uh, they decide to say screw formula racing and go independent. Thus began a new type of hyper-drag racing, with ultra-short battles and certain death par for the course. The Golden Dragon Grand Prix. But that's not all. The race takes place not down here on the asphalt, but up atop the clouds. This under-a-minute, super-extreme sport has quickly developed its own cult of fans to become the next big thing. Death-defying challengers gather to compete from around the globe, and with gambling becoming rampant, various crime syndicates from around the world have also gotten involved. Aim for the title of world champion while driving, killing, and soaring through this terrifying race of psychos. And yeah, as you can see here, this is a game done, at least partially, in old-school vector-based graphics. This was a display method for video game graphics back in the 70s and 80s. While it was only capable of drawing dots and lines, its unique and nostalgic aesthetic transcends time and sticks in our hearts and minds even today. So, oh yeah, up next is Killer Marathon. Oh, Killer Marathon? That's the, uh, that's the DLC stage. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm interested in that. But let's have a look at our boss. The Racer, a masked former sumo wrestler topping speeds of 800 kilometers per hour. Grab the handlebars, light your smoke, and become invincible. The Smoking King. The main character, Smoking King, is a former junior champion sumo wrestler. Sounds badass already. After teaming up with the Kinryu Gumi Yakuza Syndicate and becoming involved in the brutal murders of said syndicate's rival family, he's able to get off by claiming self-defense, but ends up being forced to retire. Since then, he's acted as a bodyguard for the Kinryu Gumi while also racing for them in the Golden Dragon Grand Prix. While racing in the name of making the Kinryu Gumi the world's top crime syndicate, he wears costumes to hide uh, his true identity. MC says, yeah, I love vector graphics. Can't remember if you played Obra Dean, Brady? Yes, I have. I have. Uh, I've played a bit of it anyway. I uh, still need to complete a playthrough, but it's very good and beautifully crafted at that. Um, but this isn't just like vector graphics, man. This is Neon Vector Graphics. Just a minute. Ah. 
Okay. I think we're ready for this. Gene's still with us in the trailer, right? Okay, good. Oh boy, I'm I'm looking forward to this one. And it's time, Golden Dragon Grand Prix. I never get tired of this intro. Or the Death Drive logo, for that matter. Look at this, y'all. The visual style for this game is just so good. Extremely reminiscent to me, just like the bright neon colors of Black Velvetopia from Psychonauts. Which is one of my favorite stages in any video game. MC says, so, Brady, this is Res style. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's really cool, isn't it? And Eclipse says, ooh, very nice. Yeah, unfortunately, the entire stage doesn't have this aesthetic, but a great deal of it does. And... In our little home base, because like Coffee and Donuts, there's kind of a a safe uh, hub area and then spokes populated by enemies and other hazards, uh, we get probably the highlight of the game's soundtrack. I also appreciate that the complexity of the intro movies is scaled proportionally to the type of game they're meant to represent and the era of gaming they're meant to represent. This is like an early racing game, so its intro is very, very simple. Um, Doppelganger's game was intended to represent like the mid-90s, so its intro is quite elaborate. I like that a lot. In oh. Oh man, that intro screen. Look at this. <laughs> This is what I'm talking about, y'all. This is the absolute pinnacle of the game's attempt to integrate the aesthetics and atmospheres of other genres. Eclipse says this is literally something you'd find on an ancient arcade machine. Yeah. Huh. What a tiny room. Where the hell is this? Huh? Is this Japan? I've seen this before. This is like Leiji Matsumoto's manga, Otoko o Oidan. The very, uh, Yojohan, where the gods are said to live. Holy shit, this is awesome. Grandpa's words of wisdom. The world of Yojohan is deep. Time flows backwards. It takes time to get used to it. Rely on me if you're in trouble. I'm good at navigating. I can help out. So he's actually going to be helpful today. Just wait until the music kicks in. Don't ignore the phone if it rings. Always answer it. And here we get to talk to the, the boss from the very beginning. Welcome to the world of GDGP. Your participation's appreciated. Can you make it to the pinnacle of racing, G1? The road is long and hard. First, you must win the Visitor Cup. Go, claim victory. I love that he's just wearing a harness of exhaust pipes. That, <laughs> that's amazing. Grandpa's words of wisdom. The latest VR machine is on the table. The world of Golden Dragon GP awaits. Dive in. Yeah. Oh, here it comes. Gonna wait here just a minute so you guys can hear this this music. So good. So this beautiful theme 
All of the aesthetics here are meant to evoke, like, the style and feel of, like, a 70s or 80s, um, sports manga or anime, I think. One is specifically intended for an older audience. You only hear, to the best of my knowledge, that theme in that one tiny little room, but it is so good! You know, Suda's games have an unfortunate tendency to do that, to, um, like, uh, contract these really elaborate, beautiful themes and only play them in very, very short liminal spaces in the game, like the, uh, Vinculum Gate theme from, uh, Killer7, which was available or which lasts for about three to four minutes, I think, but you only hear in little areas that take about seven seconds to move through. At any rate, time to, uh, put on our cool VR helmet and enter the race. Is this VR? What the hell is this? Another one of Juvenile's traps? Well, as a gamer, I can't just sit here and not play this new VR game right in front of my eyes. Looks fun. Let's do it. A game inside of a game. And it's just straight up a Viewmaster. Alright, so we're going to start with the Visitor Cup. And I forget, do we get to ride the Shepel Tiger? I hope so. Allow me to explain the race. It's so simple, a monkey could pick this up. Use the button to accelerate. No steering. Just make it to the goal first, understand? Now I'll tell you how to shift gears. It's the same as driving stick. Move the stick up and down while holding the clutch button. Wait until Mr. P is blue to shift gears, otherwise you'll lose speed. Be careful of the timing. Nitro can only be used once during a race when it really counts. Use it for an ultra speed up, like a real stairway to heaven. Get the timing right and you can really turn the whole race around. Okay. This might take me a couple tries. There we go. Well, we are, uh, quite clearly winning, I think. Nitro? Yeah, no, and Eclipse says this aesthetic looks so good, it's like a chalk drawing come to life. Oh, and the opponent explodes when we cross the finish line out of them! Oh, that's so good! That is so good! And yeah, no, I love the aesthetic. And as we'll see, the aesthetics of, like, the main world, or the, the combat areas here, even though they're not neon and hyper-stylized, still look really good. What the hell are you doing? Hurry up and get over here. I'm waiting for you. I'm always watching. Don't let your guard down. Each and every battle counts. Grandpa's words of wisdom. Do you know the name of the VR machine? It's the Death Drive VR Unit. The G2 final race awaits. Dive in. Clips is well, RIP the losers. Yeah, yeah. But even though this stage is super short, relatively speaking, there's a lot more to it than what we've seen. You know what playing through these games reminds me of? You know what I love about games like this where every single area or every stage is contained within its own universe or has its own distinct aesthetics? It reminds me for the world of the remarkably florid and diverse environments and stories presented by um, Kingdom Hearts, one of my favorite series of all time. I think there's something to be said for that because I've said this in many ways, several times over the life of the channel. I think this tendency towards open, sprawling, singular, like, coherent or cohesive, continuous environments in video games isn't always to the betterment of fundamental design principles and their dexterous execution and implementation, because there's something to be said for having Given the, the capabilities of stage or um, video games today, how much we can store on a cartridge, or how much we can uh, use an engine to produce, having two, maybe even three dozen totally distinct smaller stages that are each their, self, their own self-contained, totally unique looking, feeling, and sounding environment. That, to me, 
is preferable. Almost in every circumstance. But that's enough of me being on my high horse. It's time for the G2 final. Time to kick some real ass. As opposed to the fake ass we kicked in the Visitor Cup. Yeah, one little thing, as you could probably notice, uh, and it's the trick to these races. Some of them are unwinnable at first. Notice we're going almost 10,000 uh, rotations per minute. That's really good. Hey, Lady Underjoyed, welcome to the stream. Hope you're doing well, ma'am. Uh, we are playing through the No More Heroes side game, Travis Strikes Back tonight. Totally different um, design philosophy, totally different feel, but uh, the only context we need right now... So, oh, Barnworn, so Lurk. All right, hope you and the expectant mother are doing well. Uh, MC says, makes me think of a discussion earlier today. And Eclipse says, open worlds are definitely overused by some games which would be better off being split into sections. It's like when movies try and have a twist just because it's the end thing. If you don't need it, don't use it. Speaking of excessive uh, twist, uh, what about that last hour of No More Heroes 1, eh? One of the worst endings I think I've ever seen. Oh, Lady Underjoyed, I'm so happy to hear that. Uh, the kids came. That is fantastic. And you love these games. I'm glad to hear it. Um, if you have a Switch, you can pick all three of them up at relatively reasonable prices. Apart from the first two being released on the Wii, and the first being ported, albeit somewhat clumsily, to PS3, I don't think they've been released on other platforms, however. Um, congratulations, though, to, to you and to your, uh, to the, the new mother and the adorable little baby goats who are now with us. Um, you lost. Winning requires strategy. First, you have to pimp out your bike. Try powering up your gearbox. The wiki. <laughs> of course. The wiki says it's on the eighth floor of Dragon Tower. First come, first served. Hurry up. Oh. And the undead monsters in Dragon Tower are hungry for your blood. Get rid of them. Work. Power up to win the G2 final race. Get a new gearbox and tweak your death machine. It's hidden on the 8th floor of Dragon Tower. Choose your mission at the entrance. Find it. So, yeah, Dragon Tower is our combat area for the setting. The clip says, Dragon Tower? Why is it in my bedroom? I don't remember leaving it there. No, no, this is this game's take on the odd job. We're going to have to go clean up Dragon Tower. It's amazing. One thing that I find really interesting is Bug Extra is actually both coherent and helpful here. This never happens again for the remainder of the game. Maybe he's originally from this world? He seems to be older, and this game definitely has an older aesthetic. Every world has power-up items to be found. We're going on a treasure hunt. Yeah, they even call them part-time jobs! Oh, that's great! See, this is how you do fan service properly. There's callbacks to earlier games without, as Dark Souls 3 did, just constantly shoving your face into things, elements, characters, fights, recycled from earlier games verbatim. No More Heroes 2 also did this really well with, for example, Dr. Let Shake appearing as a boss. Yes, it's a callback to the first game, but it's also an entity from the first game we didn't get to fight properly. Um, so that's pretty solid integration of callbacks. Um, MC says, Someone gained a certain appreciation for older game programming. They love the concept of being able to skip a block of data in a file without it crashing. Modern games are very angry when you don't have everything set, even if empty. Games became rigid. Well, right. And from purely a marketing standpoint, so much of a game's, uh, so many of a game's selling points became uh, correlated directly with things, very vague concepts, like length and size of the world. 
Um, like, I don't care if your game is 50 hours long, if for 40 of those hours I'm just going to be clearing out the same bandit camps and climbing the same towers over and over again. That's not 50 hours of new experiences or worthwhile experiences for me. Now contrast that to, with, uh, to a game like Yakuza 0, where I'm pretty sure I put in damn near 70 hours between both characters, and most of those 70 hours were not spent uh, repeating the same tasks time and again. Okay, so here's how Dragon Tower works. Here's the gimmick. It's basically just a straight-up series of arenas and treasure rooms, but we will have to choose our path after every single arena uh, without the ability to go back. So if we want to collect absolutely everything from Dragon Tower, we will have to revisit each uh, job site several times. Uh, let's try out Brian Buster's laser. So there's a hell of a charging time, but it does deal a lot of damage. Uh, pretty wide radius, too. I, I think that's... It's okay. Is it better than triple stars? I do not know. I cannot say. start by going over here. Or no, it may not be after every stage. Hold on. Ah, it's tech -a coin Stone, rather. That's what I'm looking for. Hold on, we might want to go over here first. This also means that finding the ramen shops in this stage might take a pretty solid amount of time. Okay, more enemies. Oh, notice they all assembled in the pattern of a large two. Letting us know we're on the way, I suppose. And yeah, even though it's not as aesthetically distinct as the vector-based, uh, or the, yeah, vector-based, um, Grand Prix races, I really like the design of Dragon Tower. Oh hey, it's knockoff Bug Travis. Oh shoot. Yeah, yeah. I I think the the laser would be perfect for boss battles, but it's a little slow for moment to moment combat. Speaking of a little slow, Try doing anything now, knock off Travis. Ah, another treasure room with a chip! Lucky us! Assembled in the, the form of some kanji, I think. Alright, new chip. What is it? You know we need the chips. We're also going to reinstall the wing chip. The double X chip sets a special bomb that sends enemies up and knocks them away when hit. Okay. Like a mine, basically. Eclipse says, I like open world games a lot myself, but only when they're done well. There's some open worlds where I'm just like, yeah, no, the in-between sections are just boring. Yeah, then there's Fallout New Vegas and such that I can mod out new content or sit talking to people for like three hours without getting bored. Right, right. Open worlds where... The scope, or the scale, and the openness of the game setting actually serves a purpose in the design. Like, you use that open space to tell stories, or introduce characters, instead of just, Hey, we've got one of the biggest game worlds of all time. Is there much to do in it? Well, no. But that's, that's what you lot care about, right? Which is basically the Far Cry argument. Or Far Cry approach, I should say. And that's not even saying that all the Far Cry games are bad. They're certainly kind of cookie-cutter at this point. But the first couple, Far Cry 2 uh, in particular, were absolutely amazing. Oh, I can't believe we whiffed that. Okay, it's just us and Goldbug. MC says Far Cry was the best. You mean the first one, or like the first few? 
Because I, I played Far Cry 2 a lot when I was younger, and it was absolutely gorgeous. Well, not gorgeous, but that was the point. It was a dark story about the harsh realities of war and the, the suffering borne by those inevitably caught up in the middle. It's a beautiful, beautiful game. Uh, oh, MC says, uh, Silly Island Fun, the very first one. Yeah, 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 yeah. And MC says, Open World is entertaining when you have contained experience. Right, when you actually curate content for it. Oh, is this our gearbox? Because that looks like a chip to me. Yeah, I imagine they'd be one and the same here. Now, we ain't done, though. We're going to run back through Dragon Tower, if I can, and attempt to skirt all the way along the side to see if we can't pick up something more. What's this? Gearbox Z? I guess I'm supposed to stick it on the VR thing, then. Access the Death Drive. VR. If the Gearbox Z chip is auto-equipped, the G2 final race will be awesome. Yeah, we can... Oh, we've got to do this. It's all linear. Okay. Gearbox Z equipped to VR. Time to do this right. Eclipse says, Like, people rag on Skyrim, and it has issues, but that world is so goddamn fun to explore. You run into a lighthouse and find a horrific tale of underground monsters breaking through, kidnapping the family there, and the desperate attempts of the family to protect each other, which tragically failed. Yeah, the lighthouse that was overrun by the, the Chorus, right? Or the Charis. No, Skyrim definitely has its, its high points. Uh... I feel like Oblivion did even better in that regard. I've not played enough of Morrowind to judge, but I've heard very, very good things about it. And yeah, MC says Skyrim is great on moment to moment. Skyrim... I can't believe I'm going to compare it to Cyberpunk, but here we go. Skyrim does its, like, incidental world building really well. It's in a lot of its deliberately curated quest lines and the like where things tend to fall flat in my eyes, compared to, like, Oblivion. And there we go. We have won the G2. Bringing us one step closer to Smoking King, who is far and away the friendliest uh, member of our rogues gallery so far. He's just like a corrupt racing promoter. How's it going? Having a good time? Next up is the G1 semifinal. Win this for a chance to challenge the eternal champion, Smokin' King. I'll be looking forward to it. Oh! Without dying, uh, because there's no way in hell we could do the next mission yet, or the next race, we can move up to a higher floor of the Dragon Tower and upgrade our bike again. So we'll do that, but after clearing the 8th floor again. MC says, uh, I would say Skyrim fails at being an RPG, because the leveling system is made to progress too fast. That is not my big issue. I, I think the uh, the leveling system is largely fine, uh, or it doesn't bother me. My biggest issue is just that so many of the quest lines feel halfway done or over-reliant on the cookie-cutter, random, or, sorry, procedurally generated, quote-unquote, dynamic quests that open up after you clear the curated quest line to actually, like, round out their content. Like the Dark Brotherhood quest line, terrible in comparison to Oblivion's. The College of Winterhold, probably the the worst um, major quest line or faction quest line in an Elder Scrolls game that I've played. Um, the Companions, not particularly great or engaging either, even though some of the perks you can get are kind of fun. Thieves Guild was okay. And the Civil War could have been worse. Um... But, like, I, I just look at all the cool quality of life improvements they made and say, man, it'd be great if the writing was... and progression felt as, uh... as powerful as they did in the first game. Or the last game, sorry, Oblivion. MC says, I managed to get far more out of Skyrim by scaling up difficulty and slowing the overall gameplay. Yeah, you're, you're a fan of slower, more intentional, like, uh, mechanical character development, I've noticed. I usually have no hard set preference. For me, it's all about, like, say, in No More Heroes 1 and 2, where our character developed very quickly. That felt great to me, because all of the improvements, all the upgrades felt substantial, like I could appreciate a change in my character and my playstyle. 
My issue is with games like Avengers, where there's a progression system, and it's not fast or slow. It, it just feels very trivial, really. I don't feel like the character is changing at all. I don't feel like I'm gaining new abilities or iterating upon my extant build in any meaningful way. Those are the progression systems that really bother me. MC says, and true, the quests are just boring. We'll see, Skyrim is about fighting dragons, not enlarged iguanas. Ooh, Unreal Engine logo. Nice. We could turn this in for a shirt we will never wear. Yeah. Oh no, these are, uh, these are the slightly more robust combat uh, bugs with the blades. Eclipse says, or giant flying breathing bots. Or those irradiated bats from Fallout 76 that recycle their basic model, like the, the mesh for their model, and the, uh, their, their programming. Which, oh my god, can you guys believe that happened? Yeah, Scorch Beast, that's right, man. At this rate, Bethesda's just like the Taco Bell of AAA video game development, recombining the same three or four things into as many different ways as they can, or as many different products as they can reasonably claim are different from one another. God, you think there's enough of these guys? My goodness, we're getting a ton of EXP from these guys, ain't we? Thank goodness that that bomb does not have an AoE. Clip says, I can believe it. I don't want to, but I can. Yeah. Is there an enemy generator spawning these guys at the end of the hall? Yep. I thought as much. There we go. Well, thanks for the EXP, I guess. Clip says 76 just finds new ways to fuck up. From what I've heard, and I mean, this is nothing you should excuse Fallout 76 for, absolutely not, but it is m considerably more viable as a product now. And wait, we should have seen Cyberpunk coming. 77, it's the sequel to 76. Oh man. I saw so many uh, Cyberpunk 2076 memes in the weeks following release. It was crazy. Now let's head to the next floor. And I'm going to look really quickly to see where our ramen shops are. Hold on. I've got some pretty kicking music here. See. MC says, I just wish games were games again and movies could be movies again. I think you can integrate the, the design principles of each. Just some have done that better than others. Oh, look at these, the sucker bugs. Oh no, he's selling all of your data.
He's growing too big to be easily regu um, regulated. No! Oh, goodness. Okay, yeah, we need to fight these things almost exclusively with our... Oh, our, uh... Chips, because there is no way melee is working here. Oh, we can buy another level. Very good. Level 10, here we go. Ramen is ostensibly this way. MC says, I know what this reminds me of. Spyro 3's Fireworks Factory. Really, now? That was one of the best stages in that game. Certainly one of the best stages in the late game. Ooh, that's a lot of boogie boogie greens. There we go. Oh, we got more? Alright. Oof. That's a lot of more or less normal ones. Oh, uh, Agent Zero stage. Right, right, MC, I get you. It's kind of got that idea, or that notion of, like, small, isolated rooms where you're constantly being ambushed. Yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. Ooh, a chip. What kind of chip, though? The self chip generates an area within which enemies will be pulled towards the center. So, a uh, kind of vacuum. I would say that could replace the, uh... The slow AoE chip, but my only concern there... Oh dear. Is that, um... Yikes. So many of the enemies would not be uh, inhibited by that in the least, uh, because they would still be able to attack with little to no telegraph from a place where their movement is just being restricted, but they are still moving at full speed. Impairing their speed is significantly more important here. Ah, hello, Bugjiro! What ramen you got for us today? MC says, could also be a spark stage. Oh, yeah, man, I love the spark stages. I love the spark stages and Agent Zero stages. Tokushima ramen, a sweet western delicacy. The soy sauce-based broth is truly addictive. Oh, man, that looks heavenly, doesn't it? I would eat that. I'd eat any of these ramen uh, dishes we've seen so far. None of them look particularly unappealing. Now back to the start to work our way through the main stage, or the, the main guts of this floor. So these arenas aren't terribly difficult, but they are getting a little bit longer. And I think there might be one more after this? Uh, one more uh, floor, I mean. Which sounds right, because they did say after we make it through uh, the next race, we'll be able to challenge Smoking King directly. And I directly, I, I do remember, that stage, no matter uh, whether we're prepared or not, is actually kind of difficult. Um, even with a properly kitted out bike, his race requires near perfect maneuvering and really rapid gear shifting on your part. Hey, a stack of stone. I think we may have, with the aid of that little map of, I found, cleared out the entire uh, floor. Very, very nice. I do appreciate that each of these floors is just kind of floating in a formless gray void. Well, not gray, kind of like dull yellowish green void. Oh, it's the night. Oh, good. Oh, it's two of them. Oh, no.
There we go, that's all that matters. Doesn't matter if we took damage as long as we catch them in the explosion. God, they're fast. Okay, easy, easy, easy. There we go, and they are toast. Welcome back, Bunny, glad to see you. Um, we are nearing the, uh, I wanna say the last act of Smoking King stage. And I should ask, because you've not said uh, too much, what, what do you think about this game? You've seen a fair amount of it. I personally think the No More Heroes games are quite well made, and can't wait to see where they go uh, for the third title. I know there's going to be really extensive um, extraterrestrial or sci-fi elements to it, which automatically has me sold, because... As we all remember, the best part, objectively the best part of this series, is the fight against Captain Vladimir in the, uh, the, uh, crop circles near the end of the second game. Bunny says, I know nothing of what's going on. That is fair. Um, we are running our way through a series of extremely immersive video games designed by the CIA in order to print a colony of cloned people on Mars. Uh, that has been repurposed to use in creating an army of 3D-printed soldiers, uh, somehow. And this particular game is heavily influenced by old-school, um, Japanese sports manga and, like, Yakuza films. You've seen the series enough to know it's very flashy, very, very stylish, uh, and actually quite robustly made from a mechanical perspective. There we go. Oh god, it's the sucker bug again. God, its reach is insane. Okay, light attacks. Light attacks are the way to go. Come on, come on. There we go. Easy. Okay, so just batting larger enemies away with our, our beam katana isn't the worst strategy in the world, apparently. Oh, hey, it's our boss. This is, a uh, Sheepman Yellow, complete with, um, ridiculous exhaust pipes built into its calves? Who are you? Has Smoking King come back? Just a passing assassin. Bad luck for just a passerby. Enough bullshit. Let's do this. It's your fourth trial, punk. You know what makes a mid-boss really terrifying? Color swapping! <laughs> okay. Okay, this game's self-aware in a way that I really, really enjoy. Bunny says, playing something I haven't played since I got it for Hanukkah. Need to play more of the games I got for Hanukkah since I got one literally every day. Um, what is it, then? I am genuinely fond of this generic sheep man character we've seen now four times. I wonder if they added a new variant for uh, the DLC. It's alright, we got him. We got him. Oh man, we really do have him. Oh, another Harvest Moon game. All right, sounds good. And with that, we have our next uh, tune-up item, the Double Z Gearbox, which will allow us to participate in the next race and actually have a chance of winning. Now, I distinctly remember this stage's boss fight to be, I want to say, my favorite in the game. Score! 
Gearbox ZZ. Stick this on the VR thing and I should be able to beat the next stage. Alright, time to drop a save. And again, this is another stage where there's just the one toilet, unfortunately, meaning less money for us. Oh, this theme is so good! Why can we not have it play throughout the Dragon Tower stages, at the least? So good! Bunny says I've completely forgotten how to play it because I haven't played it for that long. I, I have a feeling there's a lot of titles in your library that have been, like, gathering dust for a bit, hey? The same is true of me because, uh, I now try to play games almost exclusively on stream because I want to share my experiences with any of you lovely people who are interested enough to drop by. Alright, time for the semi-final. After this, we have one more floor of the uh, castle to clear, or the tower, and then it's on to Smoking King. Like I said, this stage is really short, but really good. Eclipse says, I have so many titles that are gathering dust. Oh man, I bet that's true of all of us, to one extent or another. Oh, we're not going to be able to make it. We had to switch gears just a little faster. That's okay, though. These these do become genuinely difficult as time goes on. We can, we can restart to make sure we get it in time. Eclipse is virtual and physical dust. Oh, I know. I have, I have Steam titles that are begging to be played. Yo, and did you see that we finally got a formal announcement for Total War Warhammer 3? Going to be featuring not only the, the Demons of Chaos, each as their own independent faction, I believe, so you can play uh, Nurgle, Korn, uh, Slanesh, or Sinch, but there's also going to be, as part of the base game, uh, playable independent factions for the Russia-inspired Kislev, and... I want to say, is it, like, Cathay? Which is inspired by either China or, um, Arabia, one or the other. And MC's got it. Yeah, no games ever need to be played. They're only games desired to be played because they're for fun. That's right, they are toys. And Bunny says, all my games, they've all been gathering dust. Sunshine is the only non-dusty game. It's the only one I'm used to and have any kind of muscle memory for. Yeah, I play Sunshine too much, have way too many games I need to play. You really need to play through Mario 64 if if you're so uh, big into the series. It's It hasn't held up perfectly, but still surprisingly well, according to our evaluation of it on, st on stream. Uh, it's, it's well worth the time, especially if you don't 100% it and just do uh, whatever activities appeal to you. Travis, get the 64th floor gearbox. I'll be waiting at the finals. Hurry! Fight! Work! It's very big on work, this guy. This hack and slash map is pretty simple, but I guess you get used to it. Let's kick some more ass. See, Travis, as he's written in this game, is not, in my eyes, a, like, a good or a great person, but he is becoming increasingly a likable character. Like, a likable anti-hero, do we not agree? Oh, okay, Bunny, you've already played through it and you're not a huge fan. Oh, sorry to hear that. Where is our ramen, then? Hold on. Oh god, this map apparently starts you in one of uh, several different places. That might be problematic. Oh, you guys are 
just all straight up purple now? Alright, not, not gonna complain about more representation of the good old Violet, but still. Halt! Now let's see. Hold on. Doing a quick bit of analysis. Um... Right. So let's assume... Hold on. There are four different possible start rooms. Huh. We may or may not, like, totally block ourselves off from the ramen room by doing this. Nope. Nope. We appear to be good. I think I know exactly where we are, in fact. Just a moment. I will get caught up on chat just as soon as we're out of here, because I am using a map to navigate to the ramen cart. Gotta get that soup, you know? Yeah. of them here. Well, I mean, this is what we would expect from the end of the stage, right? Yeah. Fortunately, the katana being out of battery does not affect the potency of our... our chips. God almighty, there's a lot of them, and they just keep spawning. It's the supermarket all over again. And here they come, still. Oh my god, in heaven, just... Leave it! Leave it! Oh, Jesus Christ. One thing I have learned about No More Heroes, and this seems to apply to all three games, is they don't often go for straight-out enemy gauntlets, but when they do, they don't know when to stop, really. It made a bit more sense in No More Heroes 2, where they wanted to give you a protracted uh, area, I believe, to experience the combat potential of the Rose Nasty uh, outside of a boss battle if you hadn't been doing, like, the revenge missions. Uh, but, but here, this is this is just filler, I think. Ah. At least our chip combos are really strong. MC says Mario 64 has stars, Mario Sunshine has shines, stars shine brighter. They they technically do. And Eclipse says he's but he's not as abhorrent. He's more of a lovable asshole. Yeah, really. He's like um kind of a comic relief anti-hero at this point. Yeah, baby, here we go. And Bunny says, you're overanalyzing Brady like the name applies, and uh, MC says, we're the product of stars, and that's why we could shine. I mean, it's true. I think our ramen cart should be in here. Yep, here he is. That's all we need. And another Azteca stone. Nice. Granted, I've got a Hollow Knight shirt, so I'm never using it. But MC says, reminds me of Metro Last Light. That monster gauntlet was horrible on uh, max difficulty. Itadakimasu. What do we have here? North Star Ramen. A new kind of spicy ramen. Buckle your seatbelt for this delicious monster. Look at that, guys. Oh, that looks so hot, but so good. 
Is that... I can't tell due to the, the quality of the image. But it looks like it could be probably not cheese, but some kind of like shredded cabbage or something on top. Looks very, very good. MC says, but the quadruple barrel shotgun helped a little, yeah. And Eclipse says, and now I want ramen even more than before. Yeah, I know, right? I might have to order me some from a, a nearby restaurant in a couple of days. I, I have not had uh, ramen or like any kind of noodle soup from a restaurant in my, my city since I moved here. So I'm quite interested to see what it's got to offer. We've got some really good, like, Japanese and Thai restaurants, so I'm hopeful. So, are we to assume that all of these creatures are being 3D printed too? Or wait, no, 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 they're not. Uh, there are the viruses used to shut down the 3D printing apparatus, that's right. Alright, Eclipse, uh, take care, man. Uh, feel free to rejoin at any time. Always good hearing from you. And Bunny says you can pet the cat and harvest move. Well, yeah, of course you can. I'm... I want to say that was something you could do all the way back in the, uh... In the GameCube game? Yeah, Harvest Moon's always been big on their pets. Let's see what we got in here. Oh, I'm also very excited because tomorrow I will be grading papers for the first time this semester. And for the first time ever, I'll be grading papers for a course and, or an assignment that I designed. Um, a little anxious, but I'm certain that everybody, based on the early drafts I've seen, did very, very well. I've got a wonderful class this semester who've been helping me more than I've been helping them, so... Extremely proud to have them. Those little skeletal fish nightmares uh, give us not only extra lives, but also, like, full health refills and great big disbursements of XP at random, I think. Okay, what are we fighting here? Oh god, it's Goldbug again. Just the one, though? We can handle one. Oh, there it is. I was about to say. That seems almost merciful, Travis Strikes Back. What's gotten into you? Three of them. Yeah, that, that's that's more your speed. 285 on that final. That is amazing. Are they going to throw another one at us? Or... Nope, that appears to be it. Ooh, that's got some range on it, that thrust. That is like a Dark Souls boss thrust. It's alright, though. Uh, Bunny says, uh, I love the pets, cute animals are my fucking shit, we need games with cute animals as main characters. And yeah, MC recommends uh, Super Lucky's Tale is cute, the game is barely decent. I think it's better than decent, it's very easy and simple, but it's got some charming world and character design. Like, as modern, um, collectible, or collectible-centric 3D platformers go, it's, like, near the bottom of the B tier, but still, like, what would you say, MC? If you could get it on sale, like, at maybe around 30 bucks, it, it might be worth it. Or it might already be priced at 30 bucks, I don't know. I had a decent enough time playing through it, like, while I listened to podcasts or watched videos. Oh, now we're talking the Gearbox V. Or what I'm certain is, like, a Greek character or something. No, it is not. Never mind. That is just an italicized V. Yeah, and MC says it is around 30 bucks. Bunny says Super Lucky's Tale doesn't seem to be my type of thing because Lucky isn't cute enough? What? Okay, sure, fine. Score! Gearbox V! Let's stick it on the VR thing to reach new heights of awesome. Yes, Travis, let's. 
Gearbox V equipped to VR. Oh, now it's time to take on uh, Smoking King. And yeah, this one's going to take me several tries because his race requires really tight controlling. I was about to say, Vani, that's... MC says, barely decent is my assessment because it feels like it missed a step to be great. Well, it does feel like... And this is a problem a lot of, like, Kickstarter-esque games run into. They either ran out of time or money because the back half of the game, like the last two worlds... Three, if you count the DLC, which is okay. Um, feel really, really short in comparison... Um, there's, like, nowhere near as many stages, and the stages that are present, even though they're well-designed, are pretty short. Um, it feels like the kind of game, like a lot of platformers, where a lot of the charm is in the worlds and characters, like all the different environments. So it probably would have been preferable to, instead of having, I think, five worlds with anywhere from four to, like, six levels, they would have, A, probably scrapped those side levels involving very simple little puzzles entirely, to introduce a few more stages to the game, and maybe introduced, uh, maybe seven or eight worlds with three levels and a boss apiece. But that's just me. Okay, are we ready for this? Time for the final race. Is the champ gonna make his appearance, or what? Come on, Smoking King. The Dimzam Tiger is screaming to go. Oh, it's not the Sepal Tiger. Oh, let's do it. Let's do this. Um, Bunny says, What the fuck? Harvest Moon straight up crashed when I tried to save. And nice, my save is probably corrupted. I'm gonna die. Oh, jeez. Uh, not necessarily. Not if a DS game just crashed. MC says, Speaking of games, should get you into subsurface circular. Two hours long game. Hold on, let me, let me check this out. I'm always interested in adding more things to our mammoth backlog. Okay. It's a text-based adventure. Oh! Ho ho! It's like a sci-fi text-based adventure. This looks charming. I love the art style. And the aesthetic. Okay. Yeah, that looks very good. Bunny says we're talking the Switch version. Oh! Um, I don't know about Switch. I've I've had Switch games crash before, once or twice, and it, it didn't result in anything like that, but I I don't know. I hope everything's okay. Speaking of hoping for the best, Smokin' King! Oh, look at that shift box, and look at his machine! Oh, didn't mean to do that, but okay. And we're screwed. Yep, because you have to use your, your gear shift at specific times, too. That's alright. We'll get it, we'll get it, we'll get it. Shouldn't have used uh, Nitro. I also should have remembered that you hold down the right bumper to switch gears. Whoops. Left bumper is Nitrous. Which we want to use right before the end of the race, ideally. And you guys know me, I'm definitely going to be posting the uh, uh, GDGP uh, apartment theme to the Discord after this session. Oh, no, you don't. We're outpacing him! Ha! Only two tries. That is pretty good, but remember, he's got a massive cannon strapped to the front of his, uh... Massive... Massive thing. Bunny says, they say to power off for a reason and laughs in no longer in Discord. Are you not? Oh. 
I don't think I'm... Am I notified when people leave? I don't know. I don't think I have a specific channel for things like that, so... I didn't even notice, I'm sorry. Smokin' King! You're good, where are you from? Santa Destroy. Never heard of that team. Team? It's my beloved hometown. You're a tough one. I can sense your bloodlust. You're not from the surface, are you? Bingo. I'm more of an underground guy. So you're from the hood too, huh? That's right. I worked as a bodyguard for years. I protected a brilliant racer, but he died in a racing accident. However, it wasn't an accident. It was a carefully planned murder. I frantically searched for the killer. Then one day, I finally found him. It was a humid summer afternoon. Look, is this gonna be a long story? And MC says there are only notifications for joining. Right, unless you have a certain bot. I think. <laughs> Sorry. I really get into stories of the old days. Shall we change the venue? Is that even possible? We're in the middle of a race. I too live inside a game. I understand what's inside the hearts and minds of gamers. Everyone's hoping for some action. I assume they're about fed up by now since they didn't buy this game for the racing, right? Wrong! Wrong! I'm not a racing fan, but these sequences have been incredible! I mean, it's no skin off my ass, but if you don't mind, I'd appreciate it. Alright then, follow me. Oh, this fight is so good. Remember, he was a professional sumo wrestler before becoming a racer or a Yakuza affiliate. And that factors into his fight, um, pretty extensively. Have you gone to the bathroom? The champion awaits on the top floor of Dragon Tower! <laughs> oh, this is hype. This feels like the end of a chapter, a late game chapter in a Yakuza game. Like, we're ascending Millennium Tower to, to battle um, Akira Nishikiyama and what's-his-ass from the Justice Ministry in order to save our child and, like, a ridiculous amount of money. Are we ready for this? Are we ready for Smoking King? <laughs> okay, this is gonna be fun. This is gonna be fun. And it looks like we will have time to do the fifth stage today, which will be either the DLC or the fifth stage I remember. We're going to be taken into this high-tech corridor, like digital corridor. Is this one of those legendary public baths? Yeah, it's my own communal bath. Isn't the view amazing? Bitch scenery, man. It's like I got the world in my hands. Luxury, greed, and riches have limits. This bath is a sort of farewell to all of that. Nice line reading there, like a famous quote or something. Listen, racer, standing on the borderline itself is how you feel the world of true speed. If you're not standing on that line, then you're no racer. You're some guy. Hold up, I can't fight a racer. Don't misunderstand, tough guy. From here on out, I'm a bodyguard. Whose bodyguard? The champion. Smokin' King's bodyguard. Sure, that'll do. Let's go, champ. I hope I'm mastering or um, relaying the characteristically awkward and over-eager tone of a lot of No More Heroes dialogue. So Smokin' King is a three-phaser. Quite refreshing, as we've not had one in a while. He's based around lots of AoEs and charge attacks, as you'd expect. Oof, that's gonna hurt, but not a lot. Oh, that that isn't just a directional attack. Now, as long as you're patient, he shouldn't be able to deal any real damage to you at all, which I quite like. Notice the shockwaves come out, regardless of whether or not he's still focused. He's a powerful man, this. Let's see what Phase 2 is gonna do. Oh no, we're already in Phase 2. I 
I think his range is increasing and he's got a couple new attacks. But look at how much damage our blows do, or our, our chips. He's very good at um, crowd control, or I guess uh, zone denial. Oh, he just blocked a heavy attack. That is that is some impressive shite. Almost to phase three, and my god, what a beautiful bath, huh? Oof. Okay, so that, that damages us even if we're mid-dodge, as long as we're not in the air. Gotcha. Okay. Tough guy. Uh, MC says that man emits a lot of gas. Yeah. Uh, well, also, given all the canisters placed around his body, I'm surprisingly, uh... Or no, I'm, I'm quite surprised that he doesn't just go up in flame the second Travis's beam katana glances him. Like, all it has to do is penetrate one of those canisters, and this man is toast. Uh, literally. Tough guy. That's some impressive power. You're pretty impressive yourself. Looks like you're the tough guy. But the real battle begins now. Oh man. Dude's got grenades. Or no? Yeah, yeah he does. Gas grenades. Oh, yikes. Yeah, this is a very good boss fight compared to, like, many of the others in this game. Not too easy, not too hard. Everything is, for the most part, pretty clearly telegraphed. He's got a decently wide moveset, I like that. Oh, almost done. Farewell. How do you like my explosives? What kind of suplex are we gonna give him? <laughs> oh, that's sick. I love it. I love it. Probably get a B or something for that, right? Because of the damage we took. Hey, alright. Yeah, that's alright. It's not, not a great rank, not a terrible rank. I'll take it. Great fight to end off a great chapter. I really like that one. What do we think, chat? Probably the, the best stage in the game we've seen so far. It also didn't drag on for too long. I appreciate that. I've lost. What a disappointment. You're not a bad guy, champ. You're not built for killing. You're a good and honest man. That's why you're respected. I'm not a good man. I'm full of greed and avarice. Usually a boss battle is full of all kinds of unfair tricks and attacks, but your attacks are full of holes. Fight clean and fair and you'll lose. That's the code of the underground. My god, they actually intended that? Like, his clear telegraphs and the fact that he was, on the whole, way more manageable than his predecessors, what, that was intended. I... I totally forgot this bit. That's... Really smart integration of narrative and gameplay. MC says fun boss, fun area. Yeah, that's that's pretty damn good. Much better way of integrating the game's themes into gameplay than Jasper Bat. I see. Guess it's time to turn a new leaf. Thank you, tough guy. Hold up, champ. The world is waiting for you. Someday the GDGP will get a sequel. Until then, you gotta keep being the champ, you know? I'm afraid I've reached my limit. Try racing one more time, then decide whether or not that's true. It's not like you're running out of time. Travis Touchdown, you got a raise to go as a racer, but you're a true tough guy. Someday when we meet again, let's ride. I'll go easy on you next time, too. Goodbye, tough guy. See, here we have the odd example of Travis deliberately sparing someone. 
not because of some high-minded, like, philosophy of his, but due to reasons that are perfectly accessible and, I think, sympathetic for all of us. He didn't want to kill a relatively honest, decent person. In the world of real men, the realest of men rise up from nothing. I'll be looking forward to watching you two realist of men interlocked in your dance of death once again. Thank you, sheep man. What... What ship do we get now? We're going to have the ability to emit gas clouds, I suppose? The Solace chip acquired. Okay. Now, I will be delighted if we get to do the DLC stage next, but if we don't, our next stage is going to be based, um entirely around a single massive reference. It is as referential, as, like, kind of tongue-in-cheek as the game ever gets. It was a strange video game world. It seems I'd been living in both the past and future Japan for years. The illusion was that I'd been here for three years. Living here inside this game is one possible option. I wonder what sort of life I'd live as a racer. I'd like to see Smoking King back when he was a sumo wrestler. I miss that tiny, crowded room. I was filled with a kind of nostalgia. Dr. Juvenile seems to have been greatly influenced by racing games. I, too, am a huge fan of the racing games imported from Japan. Juve has pretty good taste in games. Never been a massive fan of racing games myself, outside of, uh, like, Mario Kart, or those that integrate extensive combat or destruction mechanics, like, um, Jack X Combat Racing, or, um, what was the other one I had in mind? Twisted Metal, of course. Twisted Metal's pretty damn good. It isn't really a racing game, though, it's just a straight-out vehicular combat game, I think. So scratch that, Mario Kart and Jack X, there you go. Okay, we've got more info. You know we've got more info. Including some more great background from Clark. <clears throat> so it seems as though you really have no intention of stopping. Since implementing the, the bugs, Juvenile and I have been on the run for close to 30 years. But the time to finish this once and for all may be near. We'll begin making our own preparations. However, if you too are prepared to see this game of death all the way through to the end, then in order to make sure you don't make the wrong final choice, I've decided to let you in on the secret of the DD Mark II you've been playing. The controllers for the DD Mark II are loaded with a horrible gimmick. They read the player's personal data at the DNA level, and create it clones with increased abilities and power for the purpose of creating powerful clone soldiers. These AI, or these clone soldiers are installed with a special AI, turning them into murderous weapons. If the hardware could be sold all over the world, then data could also be gathered from around the globe. Juvenile and I have made every effort possible to prevent this. Juvenile's home country is Ukraine. She lost her parents to the after-effects of the Chernobyl disaster and saw her dre hopes and dreams destroyed by the tyranny of the government. This also means that Dr. Naomi is Ukrainian, by the by. Um, Travis Touchdown, an extraordinary assassin and a genius gamer. I've heard that you're a lazy, selfish, overly opinionated fucking otaku, but also that you're just, kind to cats, and a man of your word. This short letter contains our desperate prayers. I just hope it reaches you somehow. Oh, these faxes just keep getting better and better. So where's Jean in uh, Coffee and Donuts? In a huge mansion. The interior was painstakingly done, but not in very good taste. A mansion can't just be big. Some people have no sense of style. Please come for me quickly. So she's gonna be in one of, like, the storage rooms, or... Such, I bet. We could take care of that. Anything new in the archives? No. Let us go rescue the kitty cat. Not exactly rescue, she just ends up wandering into these video games, so I guess... Recruiting? Gathering?
Okay. Sorry about that. Just had to check my email really quick. It's what happens when you're teaching and you've got stuff due um, to your Dropbox or to your, your like class depository tonight. Okay, let's go gather that cat. All right, let's see what, where she could be. We'll just start at one end and work our way on down. Not here. Nope. There's Death and Drive. Oh, we didn't see them in the last game, did we? MC says Doffy Conut. I'm sure coffee flavored donuts like would sell like hotcakes. Or do, wherever they're made. Like coffee, frosted donuts. here, maybe floor two. I do appreciate that, like, when we reload this game, we're able to proceed to any of its areas at will. We don't have to go through the whole progression again. Makes collecting any uh, items you missed much less of a chore. MC says, speaking of coffee-flavored dessert, tiramisu... Oh, I've never had any myself, uh, but I would really like to try some. I'm not, I'm not a coffee drinker. I'm not a fan of coffee, but I've seen and heard enough about tiramisu to know it's um, absolutely heavenly by reputation, and would love to be able to evaluate it myself. MC says, definitely heavenly. I, I do not doubt it. Seems like it has a delightful texture. That's the one thing I've been able to extract from the photos and videos I've seen. Very, like, soft, very spongy. Where is our cat? I guess we'll go try floor four, then. Ding! Nope, there's Bugjiro, who may be my favorite standard NPC, just for the fact that there's this one... Oh, no, no, didn't mean to go in here. This one bug that uh, has no interest in attacking us whatsoever, but would instead sell us a variety of gourmet ramen... What? Speaking of Switch errors, um, the game just crashed. Uh, nah, uh, uh, sure, yeah, fine. That's weird. Never had that happen before, but no matter, we'll just dive right on right back on in. We did save automatically, I think, after bringing down Smoking King, so we should be good. There we go. I was about to say. It's a digital version of the game, so it couldn't possibly be any kind of cartridge uh, or system damage error. It's probably just the fact that it was made on, again, that now uh, obvious shoestring budget didn't allow them to optimize it to the extent you would expect from, like, a lot of games. Which is fine. 
just fine. Like, it's it's still a really good time. It's one of only a couple times I've ever had a Switch game crash on me, though. Okay, we read it. We read it. It would have been great, though. We were in the mansion. Why couldn't it have crashed when we entered room 404? Like, come on, man. Game, you lost... You had the perfect opportunity uh, to use some top-notch comedic timing, and you just... You just blew it. MC says, speaking of crashing games. I'm going to do my best not to make a cyberpunk joke, don't worry. Don't worry. Floor 4, let's do it. Oh, Pool of Radiance, Ruins of Myth, Dranor is super finicky. I think either we've discussed that in the past, I've seen it, like, advertised on Steam, or both. I think both. I, I'm also quite curious, uh, how does, how does Baldur's Great Gate 3 run, despite the fact that it's, like, currently in early access? Pretty good? NMC says it's hard to complete without having it, uh, crash. And no, it's not on Steam. Okay, you've told me about it then. Four oh three. Nope. Man, Travis can really hoof it now, can he? Oh, and you've not tried Baldur's Gate three. I've heard it's pretty good, honestly. Jean, there you are. She was in room four oh four. Been coding too much for games. Oh, I got you. I got you. What chip did we get from the king? The Fisalis chip throws a capsule spewing gas in four directions. Gas can be ignited to cause a huge explosion. And MC says, of course she was in room 404. Cat was not found. <laughs> well, they tried to make a joke, so kudos, kudos to them. All right, back to the trailer. And then we're going to power through another text adventure really quickly to get our next death ball. I'm really hoping it's the, uh... It's the DLC. Killer Marathon. Or Killer's Marathon. Okay. Off we go. Hazare. That's the way it's intended to be pronounced, apparently. Thank you, digitized voice. Modern observation. Okay, let's just chew through this. There's, uh, there's a lot of this. Again, it's not bad. Not always great, but not bad. Uh, there's just a ton of it. We've generated too much text. Localization costs are going, getting insane. All right, MC, thank you very much. Take care. Always a pleasure uh, hearing from you, man. Have a good night.
right, so Travis needs to travel by air, but he first has to find uh, or get a new passport because exciting. Then they go to Japan. Okay. Wait, Kowloon Walled City? As in the pseudo-autonomous, like, settlement that was effectively self-governing and had its own internal industries, uh, after its development was abandoned by the Chinese government? That Kowloon Walled City? Huh. That's interesting. And they go out to a house in the middle of the sea. And maybe this guy will give us a death ball. So the guy living under the sea in just a regular old house gave us our next death ball. All right. Next. Is it the DLC? I'm hopeful. New game is playable. All right, all right, we'll save again. It is! It is the DLC stage! Killer Marathon! Oh man, I'm excited! And we don't get a briefing for it yet? Okay. That's interesting. Uh, we'll go ahead and fire it up, though. Maybe there's something special about it? I know it's got, like, an arcade theme. Like, the one promotional image I've seen had Travis, like, fighting off bugs on top of a giant pinball table. This one has me very intrigued. This is like the one bit of No More Heroes content I've not seen or done. That is current re currently released, that is. This is never gonna get old. Very good. Very, very good. Wait a minute. This doesn't look quite right. Oh, wait, I remember this. I remember this. We're not in Killer Marathon. Not yet. Where am I? It's under construction. What are you, blind? Under construction? What the hell does that mean? This is what it looks like when a location is being built in Unreal. So it's a work in progress, huh? How much of it is done? I have no idea. Go ask that woman, Dr. Juvenile. She's kinda moody. She had problems with the staff while making Killer Marathon. She started flipping over tables and stuff, made him redo the whole thing. Did somebody piss her off? Every game development team is unique from others. I mean, that's probably true for any type of workplace, but none of them are that simple. I thought that making video games was a much more fun job, but it's extremely low-key, yet delicate work. Like, surprisingly so. I see. I don't care if it's a work in progress or not, I'm passing through. Don't come crying to us if things go badly. We warned you. I'm going on a tour of Dr. Juvenile's mind. Okay, so this is not the Killer Marathon DLC stage. This is, um, instead, a... This was included in the base game. This, like, uh, rough work-in-progress stage. It's very short, very simple, as you'd expect. People who say, I'll follow you forever, usually don't. Not even 10%. Okay, Grandpa. There is a Bugjiro here. You shouldn't go any further. 
Pandora's box is coming back. It's called the Death Drive. Okay. Well, what kind of half-finished ramen do they have for us today? Oh no, it's proper ramen, the tonkatsu shoyu. The Yokohama bad boy. Enjoy the one-two punch of pork and soy sauce. Oh, that sounds heavenly. We can wander over here, though. Facts received from K. Okay, for accessing this pseudo-secret area along that non-existent path, I suppose. This is kind of interesting, though. Like, walking along through an area that is in the very, very early stages of development. Another new facts received. Okay. Uh, I'm curious, though. Is this same basic uh, geometry... The same map design going to appear at any point in Killer Marathon? And did we miss anything further back? I don't think so. Grandpa's words of wisdom. If you can't take out the mothership, you're screwed. The nucleus is also called the core. Destroy the core. Light it up. Okay. Sure thing, Grandpa. Wonder where this is taking us. If he had to give us advice like that, probably to a minigame or something, right? Yeah, Death Drive. The original Death Drive. So is this going to be, like, an Asteroids-like or something? It feels like it. So we shoot automatically as we move. Hmm. It's very strange. So you have to move in order to shoot. Which is going to make actually aiming at the core that much harder, seeing as it's parked right in front of this massive rock. Okay. Easy. Easy. There we go. Phase two. How many rounds of this are we going to have to clear, I think? So I imagine the mothership will be moving now. This is very charming, and another nice little throwback that I totally forgot about. Nope, it does appear to just be sitting there. Ah, but there it is. Missiles. Lazy missiles, but missiles nonetheless. I assume it's going to start firing more and faster missiles as we carry on, right? Next... Okay, where's the mothership? Well, there's some missiles. Oh, there it is. Oh, nice try. Nice try, we got them. Just rushed it head on. The motherships can't take a lot of damage. That's quite nice to see. And that's it. That's uh, that's it for that very, very short uh, kind of fake-out death ball. I do appreciate that they released the actual stage as DLC, though. We probably just can't get our paws on it until after the, the game is complete, I would expect. So does this mean Jean's going to be present in uh, Golden Dragon GP now? The copy of Killer Marathon I got wasn't just some pirate version. It was the Death Drive port of the legendary arcade game that started it all, created by John Winter himself. Apparently, Doc it's not finished. Dr. Juvenile must have created it by analyzing records and memories. I suddenly have flashbacks to when I was a kid, happening upon this game. 
The light emanating from the creepily alluring vector graphics seemed to pull me into another dimension. Oh, I know that feeling from exploring arcades when I was young. I wonder if Juvenile created this Death Drive Mark II specifically to facilitate this very experience. Kind of sympathize with Juvenile. No, that's just my imagination. Next up is the sixth Death Ball, the final game. What'll Dr. Juvenile show me next? Bring on the next game! So we're actually dealing with the second to last Death Ball tonight. Um, because, again, after the six, including the proper version of Killer Marathon, there is a final game that serves as the basis for the uh, conclusion of Travis Strikes Again. And I promise you, you have no chance in hell of guessing what that game is. It's very... Very unorthodox. Yes, Jean's in Golden Dragon now. Currently in Japan, the tatami floors are made of grass and are actually pretty comfortable. Japanese people apparently remove their shoes when coming inside, but I'm always barefoot anyway. Please come for me quickly. Okay, so she's somewhere in Golden Dragon GP. We also got tons of info from K. Okay. <clears throat> Hacking the CIA led to a terrifying discovery. We realized why almost 30 years of time passing had apparently reawakened the Death Drive Mark II. Deep beneath CIA headquarters sleeps the Death Drive Mother Machine. The Death Drive Triple A. <laughs> of course, a Triple A game. This Mother Machine was an all new tool of war. After creating the clones, they could be controlled remotely after being sent into the field. The clones were loaded with filtered cameras, making the opponents they faced in battle look like nothing more than the bugs you've been fighting inside these games erasing any sort of guilt and doing away with both the physical and mental damage sustained by actual soldiers in battle, these soldiers were the ultimate war machines. After Vietnam and the Middle East, these drones incapable of suffering PTSD would prove to be the most amazing and terrible solution possible to America's military issues. Clearing six games will cause the Death Drive AAA sleeping beneath CIA headquarters to reset and eventually restore itself, and you're about to make this happen. However, I want you to remember this. I'm in no position to stop you. Actually, with such an accurate idea of the timing of the system restoration, I should be able to handle this. Crisis means opportunity. We'll fight for hope. Yeah. Sure. God, the plot of this game is just bonkers. The, the virtual boy server underneath CIA headquarters originally intended for use in 3D printing Martian colonists is instead going to be used to 3D print super soldiers who are incapable of suffering from, like, the mental strain of war. Oh my god. Oh my god. We've spent such a long time fighting against the restoration of the Death Drive, but the times have changed, bringing in new advancements in AI, and the system itself has evolved greatly. Up till now, the system ran on programs created by man. But now we've reached the point where AI is able to learn independently and repair itself. And it's created an AI that can connect to and sync with the human brain. Apparently, the mother machine beneath CIA headquarters... Just never... never fails to crack me up. Has been connected to the brain of the recently dead legendary game creator, John Winter. John Winter was our teacher, and it was he who created the first version of the Death Drive. Which, I'll remind you, was just an arcade cabinet. I believed that it would be impossible to prevent the system's restoration, but then you showed up. It seems that however advanced an AI may be, the condition of having to clear all six games was crucial after all. Whether or not you end up clearing the games, the CIA will likely find a way to work things out eventually. This means we have no choice but to go against them now, while the time is right. I'll continue this later. And just sending the blueprints for the Death Drive AAA. Take a look and I think you'll understand how massively tough of an opponent we're up against. Um, no. No, I mean, it's obviously, like, a sheep monster, fitting with, like, the sheep motif we've seen uh, shared by all of the programs in the Death Drive, but no. So we're going to go check on Jean and crack her out of Golden Dragon GP, and then we're off to collect the final like, publicly released game for the Death Drive. Which is a really interesting one. It's, again, not super long, I don't think. It's also the first since, um... Since Stage 1, since Triple Star's stage, to not incorporate some kind of totally unorthodox gameplay mechanic that fundamentally changes moment-to-moment -moment play.
Hold on. Let me bring my maps back up. So I can figure out where Jean is and we don't have to spend hours searching for her. Oh, okay. That's pretty easy, actually. So she is on the 64th floor of Dragon Tower. If we can find our way back to that treasure room near the the bottom of the tower, or the, the bottom of the floor, um, envisioning these rooms we start out and as the bottom, and those we work towards as the top, we should be good. We, we should be able to reach her. And it looks like the enemies receive new pallets once again. So, maybe I was slightly incorrect in saying they don't receive new pallets, but they do not, they definitely don't receive new pallets appropriate to the theming of the, the stage we fight them in. Which, again, is one area where No More Heroes 1 still, like, holds the... holds the crown, I believe. There we are. Nice and easy. Now, let's see. If I bring up my map... Huh. Well, this certainly isn't the same place we started in before, so maybe... Wait a moment. Oh, damn it all. Wrong one. We're going to have to uh, restart or head back to the trailer. We have to receive very particular placement, uh, or and progress through the stage in a very specific order, in order to actually reach the room where Jean is located. I'm again, as always, with like Jean's bonuses in these games. I know we get something from interacting with her, or like finding her in every stage. I just don't recall what. Let's try that again. Just skip through all this. And skip that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Return to the trailer. Nope. Oof. Legs cramping up. Haven't even been sitting down all that long tonight. Just presume it's because I've done so much sitting over the past week. Let's try that again. Also gonna see if there's any way we can determine which room we begin in. In this, uh... Ah, yes there is. Yes there is. This is starting room number three. Appropriately enough. As evinced by the three coins ahead of us uh, before we enter the hallway. So we'll need to go up and then left after this. Left then down. And there we'll find our cat. And presumably progression towards whatever reward she ultimately offers. Wonder how Jean's gonna be uh, integrated into the third game. That's, I mean, she's just a No More Heroes standard at this point, so she's gotta fit in there somehow. Yes, yes, we can hear her. We can hear her calling for us. We'll be there shortly. So down from here. Ugh. 
Those attacks from Ladybug Bug have never gotten any easier to dodge. For me, anyway. And the fact that they've temporarily disabled my uh, chips is quite nasty. Alright, this ought to take care of the shield bearers. Perfect! Perfect! Not perfect performance, but perfect results. Let's just hustle on back down here, grab all of this loot that we're never using for anything. And gather up the cat. Who is hidden just out of sight? That is downright nasty. Well, she's doing alright. Alright, I think we may only need to find her one more time in the game. I don't think she appears in the final stage at any point. Fingers crossed. Now it's time to hammer through one last text adventure for the night and unlock uh, the next stage, which I believe is the standard fifth stage of the game. The one that I remember playing through. Which is very good for the record. It's where we just start having uh, cadres of elite enemies thrown at us left, right, and center. I think we've seen almost all of the, the major uh, enemies that the base game has to offer us. So now they're just going to be thrown at us in increasingly uh, difficult configurations. With some exceptions, of course. All right, Hell's Chainsaw, we are powering through this, as is our norm. This one apparently takes place in a tech firm. Attempting to acquire, like, the last death ball from, I think, the CEO of this, uh, firm. There's a lot here. Okay. Okay. Just a lot to plow through. Again, all of this is really charming and well worth your time if you can find videos just of, like, the text adventures, like on YouTube. But it does not suit a streaming environment in the least. Okay, so we're, uh... Our next game is like a high-end, like, futuristic JRPG called Serious Moonlight. Which is almost assuredly a reference to the lyric from David Bowie's Let's Dance. I, I'm imagining. Uh, but it's a really interesting one. The final game released for the Death Drive, kind of like those late uh, era Dreamcast games... Uh, involves the consoles, devs throwing everything they could into making one ultimate, like, perfect game. So let's do it. Serious Moonlight. Ooh. We should have the promotional materials for it, I would think. Nothing new in our faxes, alright. And yes, we do have the Serious Moonlight uh, promo. A super special title for the Mysterious Death Drive Mark II. 
This title screen is all the info we currently have. Expectations are maxed out. The story is apparently based on ad battling an evil demon lord in a world of fantasy. The title, the heart, and the arrows sticking out of it. Do I sense a werewolf game? I'm pretty sure you're gonna have to take down some kind of immortal, blood-sucking vampire-type werewolf who transforms in the moonlight. Running gag is this guy's predictions always being wrong. More mystery. Devs locked in a room, forced to work on the game for an entire year? Uh, got crunch, of course. So there's no info on the game itself, just the fact that it's like a really high-end uh, game with very, very, very little public profile. Final Fantasy, the 20th Century, Evil Demon Lord, and Immortal. Okay. Well, that's not super helpful, so it looks like we're going to have to dive in and play the game for ourselves. This is another one I really enjoy. Ten hours of gaming a day. Oh, I feel you there, Travis. When I'm not working, that is more or less my default mode of existence. Here we go again. Death Drive. Now, fans of Suda51 may immediately be struck by nostalgia as we are greeted by none other than Mr. Garcia Hotspur, the protagonist of Shadows of the Damned, an action third-party or third-person shooter, a uh, grasshopper manufacturer co-developed with uh, several luminaries from the Japanese game development world and, uh, of all people, EA. Based around uh, Garcia and a talking skeleton gun named Johnson, because penis, um, that's Johnson right there, um, battling through the underworld on a mission to save Garcia's girlfriend or fiancé or something from the King of the Demons. It's actually a really well-made game with some interesting mechanics, and Johnson, who can transform into several different weapons, is eminently fun to use. Now remember, Garcia or um, Johnson is just a gun throughout Shadows of the Damned, but here he gains his own body and lands back in the underworld from Shadows of the Damned. Guys, this is not serious Moonlight. It's an entirely different game. Yep, here we go. Damned Dark Knight. The actual fifth game, and it is a sequel in a single stage to Shadows of the Damned. This came, this hit us in like the fan base out of nowhere. It is so cool, it's so good. I would have loved a like PS2 era like Final Fantasy throwback stage just as much, maybe even more, but it's really cool to see some direct explicit fan service to a relatively recent Grasshopper project like this. And yeah, Johnson is our boss this time. Like, the comic relief sidekick slash weapon from the original game is going to serve as our boss. Garcia is not present at, um, to any extent, I don't believe. So, all we have to do is fight our way through the game's underworld and make it to Johnson. Or eight hearts at this point. Who is also a pretty good boss, if I recall. What's going on? The title of the Death Ball was Serious Moonlight. A huge triple-A dark fantasy RPG. But I know this world. It's from a gate on my beat game I beat six years ago. Shadows of the Damned. Garcia and Johnson fight demons. It's a famous action game. Wouldn't go quite that far, Suda. Is this the sequel or something? This is the underworld. Yep, and it falls to us to explore every nook and cranny of it. And suffice it to say, the Underworld looks extremely faithful to its representation in Shadows of the Damned. I really like that. I think we start near the end of the game, or like... 
geographically, we start near the, the end of the uh, path of progression from Shadows of the Damned. Oh, these suckers are durable now, ain't they? Huh! Death. Oh man, three of the gold bugs at once this early on. And turrets that'll now launch uh, stunning projectiles at us. That's that's great. That's awesome. Okay, as long as we whittle him down one at a time. I see an Azteca stone just below us. Oh man, we we do we're never going to get our, our special meter to charge properly ever again, given how frequent uh unique enemies or um elite enemies are gonna be from here on out. But um we're dealing a really healthy amount of damage. Okay, there we go. Is that it? Nope. This is also the point where the game just starts throwing enemies at you like there's no tomorrow. Oh god, these guys. Even they can disrupt our special really easily now. Perfect. Perfect. Good. Now let's descend the tower and let me grab... First off, Toilet. Secondly, White Sheep Man. Shadows of the Damned. The game started as Fleming, Lord of Demons, kidnaps Garcia's girlfriend, Paula. Anyway, here we are at the last stage, Fleming's Tower. Garcia has died and only Johnson remains. Now Johnson has to become eight hearts in order to extract revenge for Garcia. Right on. Let's just grab this stone. Then drop a save. Which is actually going to be pretty important from here on out, as some of these encounters, again, get kind of tricky. Now we'll descend the tower, and I think fight our way through the game world in reverse. Oh, Grandpa, what do we have? You've acquired the Death Ball for Sirius Moonlight. But once you loaded it up, it was a different game. Is this even a thing? Dr. Juvenile cancelled Sirius Moonlight. She wanted to create an, a AAA open-world action RPG. But at the time, there wasn't a single studio that was able to realize a concept of that scale with the available technology. Her idea shot down, Juvenile decided to take a huge gamble. Her favorite game was called Shadows of the Damned. She played it in the world of dreams. It's a super punk action game on which this world is based. World of Dreams, my ass. I beat that game myself. I felt sympathetic toward Garcia. You almost never see a main character as goddamn cool as him. A lot of, like, patting oneself on the back here. Back when the big trend in games was super yoked muscle heads, nobody rocked that... That dude rocked that racing jacket like nobody's business. Yes, Garcia's outfit was really cool. Not, not even gonna lie. Here's a little warning for you. Staying in the dark area will incur damage, so be careful. This is a mechanic from Shadows of the Damned. There was darkness you constantly had to dispel, or otherwise find ingenious ways to navigate. Here, the idea, I think, is just uh, killing enemies as quickly as possible to dispel the darkness. Oh, well, that was easy. Just three of them. Okay, so we're probably going to be fighting smaller waves of enemies in this area, given the uh, the darkness mechanic. Let's not forget, I saw a platform all the way over to the right that was just covered in coins. 
So we definitely want to take a trip down here. And I saw the Unreal Engine logo. Don't worry, we will be going back for it. Hey, it's Tekka Stone. That's what I'm talking about. Like I said, I don't remember this stage being too long or too complex. It's basically just massive fan service for people who were fond of Shadows of the Damned. Uh, the dev team included. Hey, Bug Gates. Been ages since we've seen you. Oh! Shoot, they dive towards us before they explode now. That's really, really dangerous, actually. Kind of impressive. So we're almost through Fleming's little maze here. One more round. Oof. There we go. Just slow him down a little and allow our heavy attacks to plow through him. These guys aren't that bad, but they are very fast. There we go, ready to move on to the next map. And it's a graveyard? Alright. Works for me. Wanted to take those guys out before they could regenerate or re-raise their shields. The mace men are like a minor annoyance at this point, how far we've come. Oh, whoops, but now they have a multi-hit combo. So the enemies do uh, improve in minor, but still impactful ways over the course of the game, or as they gain these new pallets, I, I assume. There we go. Looks like Bug Gates took care of everybody else for us. Right on. So I think we may be fighting our way back to the very beginning of Shadows of the Damned, so going through the game world in reverse order. Justine, Fleming's beloved songstress. No one who's ever heard her sing opera has come back alive. She stands before Garcia, giving the sense of a huge boss fight to come, and the battle turns out to be 2D. She's actually really girly on the inside, too. Yeah, yeah, she was uh, fought in a side-scrolling shooting uh, stage. I remember this. We're going to be uh, given the backstory, or like brief summaries of all of the game's bosses as we encounter their arenas. But actually, folks, I'm going to leave it there for tonight, given that it's getting a little bit late, and I do have some work I have to do before the night's up. But until uh, next time, hopefully sometime tomorrow, I want to thank you all so much for joining me for some more Travis Strikes Back No More Heroes today. We managed to clear two and a half stages, and we'll be prepared to finish the game up probably tomorrow, because again, the Shadows of the Damned stage is pretty short. I don't know about Killer Marathon, but we should be able to move through the, the final stage in an hour or so as well. Really looking forward to that and seeing you all again. Until next time, a massive thank you to everyone who joined me in chat today. And if you're catching this, uh, if you've just been hanging out in the audience, or you're catching this after the fact as a VOD on YouTube.com, I'm greatly, uh, or I greatly appreciate your patronage as well. Thank you all so much. We'll talk to you again very soon. Bye-bye.